Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Christos, for the invitation. And as you might anticipate from the title here, this talk is very much an outlier in this meeting because it has very little to do with theory. And I warned Christos about that when he invited me. Um, but it's something that I think is of interest and relevance to all of us in higher education in terms of how we can change the way in which we offer education to a very large portion of the people in this world. And so hopefully it'll be interesting to you nonetheless. Um, so the title of this talk is The Online Revolution, Learning Without Limits. And I'm going to start with the online revolution. Um, and I'm going to end with learning without limits. Um, so the online revolution that we're seeing today, you know, the, the one that the New York Times christened in late 2012 as the year of the MOOC, um, started out in Stanford University at uh, the beginning of the fall semester of 2011, in September of 2011. Um, it was uh, a grand experiment that uh, Stanford did with three courses, one of which was offered by Peter Norvig, who's sitting right here in the audience, with, right in front of me. Um, and Stanford took three classes that are fairly advanced computer science courses and put them up for anybody around the world to take for free. And I think initially we were anticipating an enrollment of a few thousand people. But, uh, but in a matter of weeks, each of these courses had an enrollment of 100,000 students or more. So to put the number 100,000 in, in perspective, the largest of these courses as offered at Stanford is the machine learning course that has, at the time, an enrollment of 400. I think it's up to 600 by now. Um, it's considered large even by Stanford standards, and Stanford has some pretty large classes. When that course was opened up to the world, it had an enrollment of 100,000. So in order for Andrew um, Ng, my, co uh, my colleague, to offer that, to, to teach that number of students, he would have to teach the Stanford class for 250 years. Now, besides that somewhat striking number, I think more fundamental is the fact that by doing so, he would reach 250 generations of fairly privileged Stanford students, as opposed to the students from every age group, every country, and every walk of life that were able to get access to this material by virtue of having it be made freely available to everyone. So these were the first, these three were the first of what are now called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. And it really led us to think about the opportunity that we had to take a Stanford quality education and offer it to everyone around the world to take at what is effectively a zero marginal cost per student, because the cost per student is closer to zero dollars than to one dollar. So how do you execute on something that has this much potential? Uh, we discussed it internally within Stanford for a number of months. And in January 2012, we decided to spin this out of Stanford as a separate entity now called Coursera, um, which you can see this is a fairly recent screenshot, is now partnering with 70 of the world's best universities um, to offer 374 courses um, to uh, close to 3.7 million students by now um, around in every single country of the world. So let me talk a little bit about some of these, um, some of these statistics. So first of all, let me talk a little bit about the universities. These are the US universities that are working with us. Um, and you can see some of this um, country's finest, both public and private universities, all contributing some of their best courses to teach the world. Um, you can see our first four founding partners, Stanford, Princeton, Penn, and Michigan, um, several of the UC campuses, unfortunately not Berkeley, um, Duke, uh, Johns Hopkins, Caltech, and many others, as well as some specialty schools. We have two music schools and an art school as well. So this started out as a US effort, but it's really not where it ended up. We currently have um, 24 non-US universities from some, some of the best in the world, all offering content um, to students everywhere. And you can see some of the world's um, top institutions in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, Australia, Canada. Uh, we are fortunate enough by virtue of these uh, amazing partners to offer courses in no fewer than six languages, English, French, Spanish, Chinese, German, and Italian starting up in the fall. Um, and the number one or two or both ranked institutions in 14 different countries have decided to step up and offer free education to everyone. 
The courses started out in computer science. That's definitely not where they ended up, as you might have inferred from the range of institutions. Um, courses now span pretty much to the range of disciplines. Humanities, sciences, engineering, business, um, philosophy, history, astrobiology, um, music, including performance music, art, and many others. And what we find, maybe somewhat to our surprise, initially we thought that the courses that would be the most popular would be the ones that offered a direct career advantage, maybe a programming class or an accounting class. But no, um, some of our most popular classes are history, philosophy, music, and others. Let me talk a little bit about the students. Uh, and I can stand here for several hours telling you student stories about people whose lives were profoundly impacted by having access to education that they would never otherwise have had. But I'm just going to give you three vignettes um, to illustrate three different points. So the first of these um, is an international story. This is Raul. Raul is from Peru. Um, he didn't have much access to computer science education in Peru. It's not very well developed there. But he took a number of our computer science courses, um, used that as the basis for his Fulbright application, and is now coming to study as a Fulbright scholar in the United States. This one is a little bit closer to home. These are um, a group of, of people from a very poor part of Ohio. Um, and people whose life has not, for whom life has not treated them very well. These are mostly women, mostly in their 40s and 50s. Only one of them has a college degree. All of them are either in a fixed or low income. They got together under the um, mentoring, if you will, of a woman called Sharon Watkins. They picked together a class that they were going to take. They picked the Grow to Greatness class from the Darden Business School at the University of Virginia. They took it together, and 10 of them enrolled in the class. Nine of them completed the class, and six of them passed the final exam of an MBA-level course, um, despite having no college education. One of these women is now going out on her own to become an entrepreneur based on the material that she learned in the class. And the last one is one that, for me, is a, actually have developed a close personal relationship with his family. Um, sitting on the right there is Daniel, um, who's a 17-year-old boy who's severely autistic. Um, Daniel has a speaking vocabulary of about 150 words. Uh, he communicates by typing on an iPad that was designed for him by his father. Um, by doing so, Daniel started out taking the modern and contemporary American poetry class from the University of Pennsylvania, a challenging class even by Penn standards. Was the star student in the class you can see with the instructor sitting there on his left. And, um, uh, just last week, Daniel's father sent me a picture of Daniel's wall with the five certificates that Daniel earned by taking Coursera classes and, um, and told me how proud Daniel is of his accomplishment. Um, so this is another type of access that this type of technology provides to people who, for whatever reason of health disability, learning disability, um, are unable to make use of a traditional on-campus college education. And we have a number of these, a large number. So with that, I'm going to now switch to talk a little bit about what these courses are like from the inside. So what is the student experience in these courses? So the first, is, the first point is that we didn't want this to be just a bunch of static course materials, as you would find on iTunes U or in some open courseware site. We wanted this to be an active course that the students felt some level of commitment to. And so the course, so like, just like a college course, it begins on a given day. And every week, there's stuff that the students are supposed to learn. And every week, there's homework that the students are supposed to do. And, if, and the homework is graded. And if the students don't do their homework, they don't get a grade. And if they don't get a grade, they don't pass the course, just like a college course. And you can see the implications of that simple intervention, if you will, by the usage graph that you see here. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is load on the site. And you can see that little heart shape pattern. Each of these bumps is the day before the deadline. <laughs> the day before the deadline, everybody logs in to do their homework, um, which should remind you of, uh, I think, experiences you had uh, teaching at uh, our universities. And then at the end, just like in a university, there is a reward, a certificate, a credential of some kind. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So let's talk about the three pillars of the student experience. First of those is the video lectures, the, the actual content. 
And one of the nice things is that when you move away from the constraints of on-campus in-class instruction, it really opens the door to some tremendously creative ways of teaching that are just hard to do um, when teaching in a physical classroom. So here is a couple of examples that I'm going to talk about. Top left is the University of Illinois sustainability class. Um, they wanted to really make sustainability issues come alive, so they shot a lot of the video on site at different places where sustainability issues are readily apparent. Um, bottom left is the introduction to sociology class from Princeton, our very first humanities class. It was a humanitarian sociology class. In addition to the weekly lectures, the instructor, Mitch Denier, you can see him on the left, had a weekly Google Hangout uh, a discussion group with 10 students selected from different countries of the world. There was one from Tibet, there was one from India, there was one from Africa, one from Georgia, the country, not the state. Um, and they had a discussion for an hour on the sociology questions of they that was also live streamed to all of the students in the class and, and also captured and, and placed on the site for students to look at later. And the interesting thing is that sociology, of course, is such a contextual topic with different countries, different cultures have very different perspectives that uh, Mitch Denier says that he learned more from teaching his class one time in this format than he did from 12 years of teaching it at Princeton. Because when, you, when he teaches it at Princeton, every year there is a great in-class discussion, but every year it's pretty much the same discussion because the students come from very similar backgrounds. And here he had such a wealth of different perspectives that he now has imported that to teaching his on-campus class in a completely different way. Um, and then, you know, there's other things you can do. Let me just talk about the gamification class down at the bottom right. Um, that character, that, this is from the Wharton Business School. From the right, the, the character that you can see right there in the middle is the instructor teaching part of the class as a computer game character to make some of the concepts come alive. So that's one kind of constraint that you can, um, oops, did I miss a slide? I think I did miss a slide. Never mind. Um, Hmm. Um, the other constraint that you can break away from is the fact that the lectures are not um, no longer need to span 75 or 50 minute blocks. Rather, the student can come and watch the lectures in sh much shorter units that are much better suited to their attention spans. You break the content down into eight or 10 minute blocks that are much more palatable and also, in fact, better suited to the, um, to the granularity of the content. I mean, we teach at 50 minute blocks because of the constraints of room scheduling. You have to get the students in, teach them something and get them out before the next group comes in. Now you no longer have to do that. And so this provides a tremendous flexibility for the student in um, learning the content at their own pace, at their own time, and in units that make much more sense for them. Now, of course, the lectures themselves, however, are also not passive things. And that's one of the things that we tried to do is in order to keep this material engaging, we needed to build in a lot of opportunities for interactivity. So one of the ideas that we came up with is called in-video quizzes. And you can see it right here. So this is an example. Uh, there is sound, but I'm not playing it. This is what one of the lectures, Model Thinking from University of Michigan, looks like. And the instructor is talking. The video hits the yellow notch, and the student gets asked a question. And the student has the opportunity to answer the question immediately. Um, in this case, they're wrong. They have a chance to try again, and so on. Um, now, this is the kind of question that, as an instructor, I might ask in my on-campus class. But at least speaking for myself, when I do that, 80% of the students are still scribbling the last thing I said. The ones with their laptop open, by and large, they're not taking notes. They're on Facebook. Um, and I see those of you with the laptops in the back. <laughs> And, um, and then there's the smarty pants in the front row who blurts out the answer before, that's Christos, exactly. Um, I was thinking that, but I was thinking I'd be polite, but maybe not. Um, who blurts out the answer before pretty much anybody else in the, in this, among the students has realized that a question had even been asked. And then I'm truly gratified because Christos knew the answer to my question. And then the class moves on. Um, here, every single student engages with the material and giving them a much better learning experience. Now, of course, those little baby questions where, that happen in the middle of a lecture is not where the meaningful learning happens. The meaningful learning happens in the weekly homeworks that the students have to do. And so that obviously raises the question of how do you grade the work of 100,000 students if you can't afford to pay 5,000 teaching assistants? 
And so there's two solutions that we took for this. One is to get the computer to do the nasty work for you. None of us really likes to grade. And so, how, and so the nice thing is that there's now a reasonable range of homeworks that computers can grade automatically um, and fairly effectively. So there's multiple choice of different kinds. And you can do a fair bit with multiple choice if you think about it. There's the short answer questions that um, I showed you in the, in the example video. Um, there is pretty in-depth grading of math expressions that grades not just on syntactic identity between two expressions, but also on semantic equivalence. So you can do a lot more with that. And then there is the grading of anything that has a structured form, be it uh, the output of a computer program, a computer model, or even an Excel spreadsheet. As long as it has a fixed structure and you know where to find the pieces, you can grade this. And so that really sets up, I think, and uh, sort of this ability of a student to really practice with the work until they get it. So let's see what that looks like. So this is one of the exercises from the CS101 class uh, that uh, one of my colleagues from Stanford taught. Um, and you can see the student's supposed to color correct the image. They're actually programming JavaScript in the browser, so it's all done in the browser, the grading. In this, they didn't get it the first time. They had a chance to try again, and they got it the second time. Now, that aspect is actually one of the most fundamental contributions of computer-based grading, which we put in primarily as a scalability mechanism only to discover that the pedagogical advantages are even larger. Because what happens when a student submits a piece of work for a traditional on-campus exercise, usually a matter of three to four weeks elapse between the time that the material is learned they get the homework, submit the homework, and get the graded homework back. If they didn't get it, by the time they know they didn't get it, it's far too late for them to go back and really relearn the material because the class has moved on. Here, the feedback is immediate. And that turns the whole interaction into a computer game, especially for this generation. Because they get the feedback, and they realize that they're, only, that they're not doing so well, and so they try again, like in the examples that we showed. And you can see the impact of that in this fairly typical graph where the blue bars is the initial distribution of scores for the first submission of the assignment, and the green bars is the distribution of scores for the final submission of the same assignment. And you can see that people naturally gravitate towards achieving a perfect or close to perfect score. Now, of course, all of you are sitting there saying, well, yeah, OK, fine. If you put a monkey next to the keyboard, you let them try often enough, they're going to get a perfect score also. Does that indicate that there is actual learning going on? And so we did some analytics um, using some machine learning modeling. And what came out of it is that it seems that the answer is yes. That is, if you look at students who performed comparably in, say, the initial submission of problem set one, and you look at the ones who did mastery-based learning versus the ones who didn't, the ones who did mastery-based learning performed better also on the initial submission of problem set two which means that they're actually learning something that allows them to perform better on future um, assignments down the line, not just get a higher score on the one that they're practicing on. And so that, I think, is, a, is an indication that this is actually valuable pedagogically. OK, now this, of course, only takes you so far, because many classes have assignments that really cannot be graded effectively by a computer right now. Um, things that don't have a clear right answer, um, you know, things that correspond to critical thinking or problem-solving skills. So in order to do that, we put in place a peer grading pipeline that combines ideas from uh, mechanisms that have been employed in on-campus classes, of fairly small ones, 20 or 30 students, combined with ideas from crowdsourcing. And together, that uh, constructed a peer grading pipeline where students get a grading rubric or criteria that are designed by the instructor and are grading the work of their peers to those criteria. And you can do a pretty broad range of assignments with peer grading. So here, for example, is um, peer grading of an assignment whose where the task was to critique a scientific paper. This was in the pangenomics class. So this is critical thinking in its purest form. And the students did the critique. And then other students critiqued their critique and told them what they, which points they thought were valid, which points they thought they had missed, and so on and so forth. Now, you might ask whether peer grading is actually effective. That is, are students who are not necessarily skilled in the material themselves capable of grading um, the work of their peers? And the answer is sometimes. It really depends on the quality of the grading rubric. 
If the instructor puts careful thought into making sure that the criteria are well defined, then you actually get some pretty um, solid results. So this is, for example, from that Princeton sociology class that I mentioned earlier. The instructor and his TAs graded 1,200 final exams, each with three essay questions. And, what, and they compared the grades from the TAs to the grades from the peer grading process. And the x-axis is the TA grade, the y-axis is the peer grade, and you can see a very strong correlation that I would argue is probably as good as you would expect for two TAs grading the same piece of work. Now, of course, if you have a really bad grading rubric, then you don't get these results, but this shows that you can get very high quality um, results from this. Now, there's two nice things about peer grading that, again, we weren't necessarily expecting going in. The first is that also it is not purely a scalability mechanism, but also a pedagogical tool. Because when you think about a student doing the grading, this is an assignment that they had just finished struggling with themselves. And so they thought about they could do it this way, they could do it that way, they picked a particular path. And all of a sudden, they see that there's five different ways of getting to the same goal. And seeing that the same solution can be solved in different ways is really, in many ways, a first step towards teaching creativity. The other aspect of this is that you can do a lot of uh, types of problems in peer grading that we weren't anticipating going in. So here is the semester-long project in a Wharton Business School design class. The students started out with a problem specification, a concept, a prototype, and finally an artifact. And at every single step of the way, they got grades from, and, and feedback from five of their peers, which means that by the time the course ended, they had gotten 40 pieces of feedback, which really helped them refine their designs. And you can see here some of the three, three of the many final projects that were submitted in this course and see that the students actually ended up doing some pretty remarkable things in this online class. In a, project that you, in, a, in a project class, which many people would have said going in, you can't do it at a scale like this. And this is, by the way, how we grade, for example, our performance music classes. We have a, an improv jazz class being taught by a seven-time Grammy Award winner from the Berklee School of Music. And they're grading improv jazz pieces using peer grading. The last pillar of the student experience is the community. Because the one, one of the very few things that you really just can't scale is the ability of an instructor to interact in meaningful ways with students in the class. Um, because the instructor time doesn't really extend that far. And we know even it, for us as an on-campus instructor, it's difficult to provide meaningful feedback to more than 100 students. So what we've done here is replace the hub and spoke model with a peer-to-peer -peer model, where students are effectively serving as teachers to other students. So students are posing questions on the discussion forum, and other students are answering those questions. And in many cases, they're answering those questions better than an instructor would, both because they have more time, but also because they have just finished struggling with that same problem themselves. And so they might have a deeper insight into what's confusing about it, and therefore provide a more useful answer. And we're told by many of our students that this, in fact, is a more collaborative and sharing environment than many on-campus courses because of the sense of community that gets built up around the course materials. And then, of course, students just, you know, told us by, with their feet that they really also value face-to-face -face interaction. So without any kind of prompting, they organically created little communities of people who meet once a week to talk about the course materials. They meet at coffee shops, um, people's workplaces, or people's homes, and they do their homework together and talk about the course materials. And there's now well over 2,500 communities um, of people doing work around these courses in different cities around the world. So having finished the course, I, I mentioned to you that there is some kind of certificate or credential at the end. So let me talk a little bit about that. Um, this is credentials 0.1. This is what Stanford University let us provide in the fall of 2000, in the fall class of 2011. It's a statement of accomplishment, a letter from the instructor to the student, signed by the instructor. Um, the only place where the instructor's affiliation is mentioned is, it's, sorry, where the institution is mentioned is in the instructor's affiliation. And in fact, in the boilerplate at the bottom that says this is not a Stanford class, it doesn't even resemble a Stanford class, it doesn't confer Stanford credit, and we don't even know who the student is. So despite that somewhat vacuous credential, students were actually making use of this for all sorts of purposes, to get 
in line for an interview for a job, and we know many students who got jobs based on this credential, but even in some places, the universities habitually gave students college credits for completing Coursera classes. University of Helsinki just made it a policy. Other universities did it a little bit more on the slide, but it happened a fair bit. Now, how I wanted to do a little bit more than that, specifically get rid of some of that legal boilerplate. And so in um, January of 2013, so just a few months ago, uh, we launched what we call the signature track. The signature track is a way to get students to um, map their accomplishments to their real world identity. And so what happens is that when a student decides, elects to join the signature track, and it's entirely optional, they join, um, they submit a government issued picture ID that, um, that that is then compared to their webcam photo, so we know who they are. And then they also create a biometric profile, which in this case uses keystroke biometrics. It turns out that if Christos and I type the same phrase, it's going to look very, very different in terms of the rhythm. And I can't forge Christos' signature, and he can't forge mine. Even if I try and help him, he can't type like I do. Um, and so you can now identify students every time they log into the platform and confirm that they are in fact participating in their own learning. And that allows us at the end to give them what we call a verified certificate that actually has the university brand on it and doesn't have all that legal boilerplate about how we don't know who the student is. Now here's one nice aspect of this that, um, that turns out to be the case. People talk a lot about the lack of retention in MOOCs. It's one of perhaps the most common criticism against this, um, against this model. Now, I think the people who criticize MOOCs for lack of retention haven't stopped to think about what a MOOC really is and what the student population looks like. The vast majority of the students who enroll in a MOOC have no intent to complete it. They have no intent of submitting even a single piece of homework. Um, and so, sure enough, they, in fact, they don't complete the course. Many of them are treating this like a library book. They log in, they watch a few lectures for maybe three or four weeks, and they figure they got something out of it, and then they stop. And in the same way that if you return a book to the library before you finish reading every last page of it, it's not a failure of the book, it's also not a failure of the course if, you, if a student who doesn't intend to complete doesn't complete. However, when you look at things like the signature track, the question is, in this case, students are committing effectively to completing a class. Are they completing the class? And so you can see these are some of the results, whereas the overall completion rate in a typical MOOC is about 8%. The overall completion rate for students in signature track is about 75%. Furthermore, if you look at students who in an entry survey declare that they're highly committed to completing the class, 85 of those, 85 percent of those, 84 percent of those students complete the class. If students sign up for signature track. It's about 95 percent. So, which actually, I guess, shows that if you have some skin in the game, it actually improves your retention, which may be not surprising in retrospect. Okay, so. That's the signature track. And one thing that about the signature track is it does cost money. The, there is a human in the loop. The human has to create the, you know, look at the webcam photo and so on. It's not hugely expensive. It costs about $50. Um, it's entirely optional. You can still take the class and get your statement of accomplishment without signing up for this. But because we, we realize that there's a lot of students out there for whom $50 is actually a lot of money, maybe not so much in the United States, but in other parts of the world, we put in place from the very beginning of this program what we call financial aid program, which is basically a waiver of the fee for this, uh, for this program. And we have uh, given well over a thousand of these financial aid uh, awards, if you will, to people all around the world. And here's just a few of the examples. There's over a thousand of them. I'm not going to list all of them. But let me just mention a couple. Um, there is a professional in Bangladesh who realizes that half the students in his country don't have electricity and is taking the energy class to see how to fix that. And then there is a student in Chile who wants to apply for PhD programs in the US or Europe to study Huntington's disease for family reasons. And, um, and so she's taking the neurons, um, synapses, and brains class from the Hebrew University. So that's the end of the student experience piece. And the last piece of this talk talks about how we believe this could improve learning outcomes. Um, and we believe that improvement can be gained in two very different ways. The first is just in the online format itself, and the second is in face-to-face -face teaching. 
So in the online format, um, the first is just the amazing ability to collect data about student behavior and student performance because every component of the platform is instrumented and we know exactly what the student is doing when they drop off watching videos, when they rewind to watch something again, looking at a forum post, posting a forum post, submitting a quiz and so on. And that gives us basically a big data view of human learning and the opportunity to turn human learning from an anecdotal science to a data science, a transformation that has revolutionized fields as diverse as astronomy, biology, medicine, and many others. So how do you use big data in understanding human learning? First of all, you can use it in the context of a particular course. So here's one little vignette. Um, this is a distribution of wrong student answers in one of Andrew's machine learning exercises. The answers happen to be pairs of numbers, so you can graph them on a grid. Um, the little crosses are one-off wrong answers, where just a, single, uh, uh, just a single student made that mistake. But for example, that big cross at the top left is where 2,000 students made the exact same wrong answer answer in this infinite space. Now, if two students in a class of 100 make the same mistake, you'd never notice. But when it's 2,000, it kind of jumps out. And so Andrew and his TAs went in, understood the basis for the misconception. It turns out the students were inverting two lines of an algorithm. Um, and now every student whose answer falls into that bucket doesn't just get a sorry, you're wrong message. They get a sorry, you're wrong, and you might want to think about this, thereby providing them a much more rapid path to correcting their learning. So that's one place that you can get improvements. The other is by getting insight into high-level pedagogy that is not necessarily in the context of a particular class. So one question, for example, that often gets asked is, should we or should we not show the instructor's face in the video? Sal Khan, for example, from the Khan Academy is fairly insistent that showing his face in the video would just distract the students. Other researchers suggest that it actually is beneficial. You know, it, it's hard to say when you have a small sample size. But here we don't have a small sample size. We have a huge sample size, so we can do what's called, in Silicon Valley jargon, A-B testing. A-B testing, whether you've heard the phrase or not, is something that you have undoubtedly participated in. Because every time you log into Google, Facebook, or any other large website, there is about a 5% chance that you're in the B group, which is getting a different user experience than the A group. And then the website is tracking whatever metrics they care about, be it click-through rates or anything else. And they are then measuring which group gets the better outcomes. And if the B group does better than the A group, the entire site flips over in a matter of days, which is what allows these sites to do continuous iterative of improvement to the user experience. We've never been able to do that in pedagogy, but now we can. So here is one example of an A-B test in uh, Dan McFarland's Stanford class on organizational analysis. And we tried out whether the instructor's face is good or not good. The, the A group had it, the B group didn't. And you're all probably waiting for me to tell you which group did better, but I won't. <laughs> and the reason I won't is not because I'm being secretive, is because the students in the B group were so pissed off that they didn't see the instructor's face that they complained on the forums bitterly and they had to stop the experiment in the middle. <laughs> and so we don't know if the students would have done better with the instructor's face than without, but we know the students wanted it. Now, this of course is just one example of A-B testing. We've now sort of rolled out a framework for A-B testing that's sort of much more uh, reliable and robust than just a single experiment. And we're now running A-B testing on all sorts of different things um, that can help us get better pedagogy. Okay, now the data analytics and the ability to personalize the student experience is actually, I think, a key, f a key aspect in solving uh, what is a 30-year-old problem in improving learning outcomes. So there is a very famous paper called um, The Two Sigma Problem by renowned educational researcher Benjamin Bloom almost 30 years ago. In that paper, Bloom studied the achievement score distribution for three populations. The first is the population of students who learned in a traditional lecture class. Not a very large lecture, mind you, about 35 to 40 people. Um, the second population is people who still learned in a lecture, but in a mastery learning format, which means they weren't allowed to move to the second topic before demonstrating competence in the first. And the third is the population of students who are fortunate enough to have an individual human tutor. And you can see that each of these interventions gives a full standard deviation or sigma improvement in performance relative to the previous one. 
So Bloom, in order to illustrate what a two sigma uh, uh, improvement in performance is, points out that if we pick the midpoint of the lecture-based population as a performance threshold, this is what the, uh, the average student gets. So half the students are above that and half the students are below. If we use that same threshold for the green population, the, the individual tutoring, 98% of the students are going to be above that threshold, or in a kind of Lake Wobegon kind of way, above average. So that, of course, is the motivation for the title of Bloom's paper, The Two Sigma Problem, because Bloom points out that as a society, we can't afford to provide an individual tutor to every student. But maybe we can now provide them with a tablet or at least a smartphone. And so the question is now, can we use technology to move us from the blue curve to the red curve and ultimately to the green curve? So the question is, I mean, for the red curve, I think the answer is a pretty straightforward yes. Computers are actually really good at mastery because they don't mind showing you the same video five times. They don't even get judgmental if you don't get it after the third time. And so the, I think the red curve is easily done. The green curve is obviously a little bit more challenging. Um, how do you create, how do you use a combination of big data um, and analytics to, to really give the kind of personalization that allows the student to get closer to the green curve? And that's, I think, an, really exciting research question. The last place where I think we can get big improvement in performance is in our own college classes. So this is one of my favorite quotes by 19th century educator Edwin Slauson, who said that college is a place where a professor's lecture notes go straight to the student's lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> Now, maybe not the most flattering view of the college experience, but when you think about this, maybe not unjustified. And so the question is, can we now do something that looks more like this, where students come and into the material having learned a lot of the basic content and the basic skills with the ability to achieve mastery, to study at their own pace, to practice and practice again, um, and then they come into class to learn those skills that a computer really can't teach effectively. Creative thinking, problem solving, debate, explanation, the kinds of things that really require interaction with a human, which currently in large lecture halls they just don't get. So really you get, I think, the best of both worlds by leaving computers to do the teaching that they're good at and letting faculty do the kind of teaching that only they can do. So, um, in fact, this gives rise to, I think, one of the interest, one, a very interesting insight that one of our instructors, um, Christian Turwish from Wharton, he's an operations management instructor who taught an operations management class on Coursera. And his last lecture, which you can find on YouTube, it has a lot of cool insights, um, is a case study of MOOCs. And Christian says that instruction is a trade-off along a Pareto optimal frontier. This is the most theoretical slide in my talk. Um, the students trade, I mean, you can trade off instruct faculty productivity, the number of students covered per hour of work, with student learning outcomes. Traditional instruction, like a large lecture, is pretty efficient in faculty productivity because you cover 300 students in one lecture, but learning outcomes are not that great. Personalized instruction, like, um, like in a office hours, for example, very low productivity, great learning outcomes. Christian argues that MOOCs give us a whole new frontier, which, give, which provides a completely different set of trade-offs. And you can use that trade-off in different ways for different student populations. So for example, if you want to offer a MOOC to people in Africa and Bangladesh who would never have access to education, you can basically keep student learning outcomes about the same as they would be in a large lecture class, but reduce the cost per student to what is effectively the zero marginal cost per student that I started out with. Or if you want to give a better education to the students at your own academic institution, then you can keep faculty load the same, but give them much more of an opportunity to teach active learning and, and creative thinking skills um, and therefore improve learning outcomes. And obviously these are just two points on this trade-off that people can engage with. And I'm gonna skip past this. Um, and so I'm just gonna end, um, this is, I thought I had one more slide. I'm just going to end with the last two slides that talk a little bit about the breakdown of the student population and what implications we think it has for offering people um, education. 
So currently about 80% of our students actually have college degrees. Um, for about half of those have advanced degrees. And partly it's because until very recently we haven't had a mechanism for offering students credit for the courses that they're taking. And so if you can't give somebody credit, it's kind of uh, the opportunity cost for them to take a non-credit bearing class if their degree seeking is quite high. So many of them don't. But at the same time, the other reason why we have such a large fraction of uh, students who are not, uh, who are lifelong learners is because if you think about it, your formal college education ends about, what, 10 years in your, into your adult life? And after that, for most of us, maybe not those of you in this room, but for most people, the opportunities that they have to learn new stuff are actually quite limited. They can read a book, watch a PBS documentary, um, find a babysitter three times a week and go to a community college class. I mean, the opportunities are not great. And this provides people with an opportunity to learn something really exciting and new anytime they want and really become lifelong learners. The second breakdown of our population is geographic. Um, only about a third of our students are in the United States. Um, about 28% are in Europe. 40% are in what the State Department defines as the developing world. Now, these, for most of the countries in the developing world that are represented in this chart, there really isn't, for most people, any other opportunity to get a high quality education. Because even if you ignore the issue of quality, there just are not enough educational institutions at many of these countries to offer education for the many people who need it. In India, for example, they did a study a number of years ago and showed that in order to increase the post-secondary completion rate from its current level of 13% to the 30% they would need to get to a 21st century economy, you would need to build 1,500 new academic institutions. 1,500. And aside from the question of where you would be able to raise the funds and the ability to build 1,500 institutions, they don't have instructors right now to staff the institutions that they already have. So where would you find instructors to staff these new institutions? So this is in many ways, the, I think, the only avenue that you would have to bring education to the many people in those countries that need it within this coming generation as opposed to a generation or two from now. And so I think this is an opportunity for all of us to take education and turn it from a privilege of the few to a basic human right. So I'm just going to end this with one final anecdote. In September of 2012, I attended the launch of the Education First Initiative in the United Nations, whose goal it is by the Millennium Development Goal to bring education to everyone around the world who wants one. And they were talking about how when you travel in Africa, in, even in such places as refugee camps in the Congo that have, um, you know, where people are living on a cup of food a day in, in grass huts, and you ask them what do they want, most of them don't say they want more food or that they want better shelter. They say they want a better education for their children because they know that giving their children education is the only way to break them out of the cycle of poverty. Thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Lots of questions. If I understood uh, what you said, the financial model you offered seems to me very weak. In the longer term, who is going to pay for the preparation of the courses and pay for evaluation? You have to remember here mm -hmm. where we're sitting, the state pays for less than 10% of the budget of Berkeley. So things are not in a good financial state, and we're not going to give away our expertise for free. Um, so the financial model is um, one that we're currently working on, and there's a couple. You know, there's one that's already started to, to provide what I consider to be promising revenue. So in the in the first quarter of 2013, this uh, verified credential, the $50 one that I mentioned earlier, running on a handful of classes for only a couple of months because we only launched it at the end of January, brought in $220,000 over five classes. Um, right now, we're way past that as we're nearing the end of the second quarter of 2013 and still running on a relatively small fraction of our classes and with uh, an, a, an ever-increasing student base. We are actually quite, I mean, we've done some modeling here and we're actually somewhat optimistic that this can provide a reasonable revenue stream to sustain this effort. The, 
sorry, can I just? Aren't the, aren't the costs of creating these courses much more than what the user experience? The cost. So the cost of creating these courses um, is about, say, on average, thirty to fifty thousand dollars. So it's not a an insignificant amount, but it's not huge, and a few, and it, they can be reused again and again with relatively little modification. And so if you're bringing in a revenue of, you know, ten to twenty thousand um, dollars just to the institution per class over uh, over a year, it actually has repaid its cost. So. Not, not that much, actually, because it's mostly running. But we, we can maybe talk about the financial models in more detail offline. But let's put it this way: our investors are confident that this is going to be fine. So. Uh, Daphne, have you thought about using uh, MOOCs for K through 12 education? This would seem to be the most appropriate way of serving. So, um, so people keep asking us that because, as, because they correctly point out that the problems in education often start a lot sooner than higher education and that you really need to make an impact on younger age groups. And so there, we have a twofold answer to that. The first is that we're already starting to see use of our content in high schools. Um, that's, that's happening in many of our upcoming entry level courses, intro physics, chemistry, programming, math, and so on, are being used quite commonly by high school students. Um, we don't actually think this is the right user experience to teach a seven-year-old how to read or a five-year-old how to sit still and pay attention. And so in order to help with that effort, we announced about a month ago a, um, an initiative to teach teachers. So we're not teaching direct to student, but we're providing free teacher professional development content from a whole range of institutions, including ones like the uh, British Commonwealth Fund that are specifically aiming for teachers at, in the developing world so that they can can teach our children better. And part of the Millennium Development Goals that I mentioned are actually to, um, to train 2 million new teachers by 2015. And so we're hoping that that can help with that. You spoke about the Princeton sociology professor being so impressed with the quality of the online discussion compared with in-class discussions. What quality? Breath. The breath. Yeah. I'm wondering, how, how is such a discussion Structured. I mean, you, you would uh, you can't review and see every question. I would assume. Uh, how how are they? Uh, how are the questions selected? So the question is, how does how is an online um, discussion structured? This was actually as a video chat, so it was synchronous, and it was a relatively small group of students. I think eight or nine. I forget the exact number. So they, you, it was actually kind of like a live discussion, except via Google Hangout. Um, but we do have a lot of instructors who log in religiously every couple days and, and engage with the students in the asynchronous discussion via the discussion forums, and they find that to be incredibly inspiring and and thought-provoking. One of the things that we've put in is a design of a discussion forum that scales. So students vote up. No, you don't, it's, it's actually, it's a voting scheme. So it's not a random sampling, it's a bias sampling. So students vote the best questions up and so the instructor, when he or she logs in, gets to see that these are the 10 questions that the most students thought were, were interesting. And so they answer those questions. And that gives rise to, I think, a very high quality discussion. Thank you. Okay, so the question is, can we crowdsource courses? That is, can you have multiple instructors contributing to the construction of a course? And I guess my answer is, it's, it's, not a technical, it's not a technological question. It's a, it's a pedagogical question. Certainly, we have courses that are authored by multiple people. We have, I think, the largest we've had is seven um, co-instructors teaching together. And we're very supportive of that. Um, I think I'm less 
a fan of the grounds up, let people add stuff and create something together because you end up then with something that looks like Wikipedia, which means it sort of meanders and sort of goes in different directions. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> but Wikipedia is very useful, mind you. I don't want to upset anybody, but, um, but it doesn't, it's so not. Crowdsourcing is one thing. Open sourcing, I think, is going to be the real answer, you know, with that. You know, so crowdsourcing maybe, maybe, maybe is problematic. Mm -hmm. but Picking and choosing, so you know, and contributing. Uh, yeah, and, and that's up to the instructor. I mean, if you're an instructor who wants to get feedback from people, and you basically play the role of curating your content so that you end up with something that you consider to be coherent, that's great. I'm a little leery of just letting people contribute to a single whole and expecting that to give rise to a coherent course experience. I, that, that's just my own perspective, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. You intellectual, intellectual rights, uh, you know, that's a really good question. I can tell you who doesn't own it. We don't own it. Um, the dilemma is whether the university owns it or the instructor owns it or whether it's a joint ownership. Different universities take drastically different policies on this. And I can tell you about some of the models that I've heard, but it's outside my jurisdiction. We do not lay claim to any of the IP. You know, so the question for those of you in the back is, are we worried that now there's more universities and more courses being offered of having extensive overlap? So we have 374 courses right now. It's a lot by some metric. A typical university has between four and 6,000 courses. So I think when, uh, if you took your average course catalog and you threw a dart at it, chances are you would hit a class that we don't offer. And so I'm not super worried about overlap right now. And furthermore, I think that if you had three, four versions of calculus, which, by the way, we already do, I think that would only be to the betterment because it would give people choices. Do we need 500 versions of calculus? Probably not, but I think having five or 10 is actually good, and we're nowhere close to that yet. Javi. Uh, it's an obvious question. Uh, it's a great, uh, fantastic project, and uh, what is the future of the university? Uh, is it uh, you know, 10 years ahead? Or yeah. <laughs> so I don't think that this is a substitute for, um, for having a professor. And I read a quote somewhere uh, uh, recently that, where somebody said, if you can actually be replaced by a computer, then maybe you should be. Um, so I think that what professors offer is... <laughs> I think what you get at a place like Princeton and Stanford is really unique. And um, the ability to interact in, in a very one-to-one -one fashion with somebody who is the leading scholar in their discipline is a unique opportunity. And in the same way that you know, we can now buy a song on iTunes for 99 cents, and yet my daughters are at me all the time to take them to the Taylor Swift concert that's happening in Sacramento, of all places, in July or August. I mean, people still value that, that much more intimate experience. I don't think universities are going away. What I think is going to happen is that universities are going to have to redefine their value proposition to be about something other than content. Because content, high quality content, is about to become free and ubiquitous. And so the question is, what do you provide to your students that transcends that? And I think that all of us have an opportunity at all levels of the academic echelons to have a, a much more significant impact on our students, whether it's at a place like Princeton or Stanford, where it's the ability to interact with a leading researcher, or in a community college where you have kids coming in who didn't learn the study skills they should have learned in high school, and this is a place where maybe they have a chance to learn it for the first time. So I think there's opportunities here. I, I Great. So, my question is, do you have to be affiliated with an educational institution to be able to offer a course? The short answer is yes. Um, we, don't, we don't have the capability right now to deal with individual instructors, so we're doing it via institutional partnerships. 
Oh, there's one down here, Christos, also. So, so which one do you want first? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Okay. Do you, do you measure, uh, other than the, well, I guess this is a, a, an artifact of this, the, 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 the people that come together in groups, do you measure the feeling of isolation? <laughs> because that, that seems to be the, the, the human dimension of being in the classroom setting where you see the faces and the eyes. So, you know, I think that, so, oh, sorry, yes. So, so the question is, do we think that this is missing the human element that you would have by sitting in a classroom together and seeing faces? Um, and I have two answers to that. The first is that today's generation is actually, in many ways, preferring to get their interaction via digital media. Now, you, you know, you and I are from a different generation, but my kids would happily sit in a room, in two different rooms, chatting each other than, as they would to be, I know it's crazy, but that's what they seem to like. So I think that there is a generational aspect of this, and today's generation is actually much more accepting of the kind of interaction you get via digital media. The second piece of it is that this is not by any means a, a prohibition to come together and learn. So when I talked about the Ohio experiment, these were 10 people who got together once a week, facilitated by this woman, to Sharon Watkins, to learn the material together in uh, augmenting what they learned in the online format. And so I think really what you want is the best of both worlds as opposed to just one or just the other. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. What sort of progress have you been making on using instrumentation effectively for better pedagogy or other aspects? And what else you might contribute? So, um, I mean, the, so the platform is actually instrumented every last inch of it. So we know exactly what the students are doing in ev at every moment that they're logged into the platform. Um, I think that you know there's tremendous opportunities to use that to get insights into, into human learning that we've only started to scratch the surface of. And I've mentioned a couple of the results. We've done a few other studies, but our analytics team is two and a half people. Um, they're busy building out dashboards and collecting data and doing the basic analytics. But fortunately, we share all of our data back with the universities that provided the courses. And so at each one of our many partner universities that have already offered courses, there's teams of people starting to look at the data and see what they learn about that, uh, from that data about the efficacy of peer grading, mastery learning, which is a study that we did, uh, as well as a whole variety of other questions that one can now finally start to answer. Okay. Okay.